One of the greatest resources we have in the keto and carnivore community is Dr. Ken Berry. Now, if you haven't heard of Dr. Ken Berry, then you've either one, been living in a cave and just now found the internet and or a smartphone, and for that, congratulations, or two, you're new to the keto and carnivore community. If that's you, then welcome. It's a great place to be. For those of you that have heard of Dr. Berry, you know if you go to his page, he's got over a thousand videos. So where do you start? Well, in this video, I've put together the top 10 things that I've learned from Dr. Berry. And those things range anywhere from how to start the keto diet or carnivore diet, to deficiencies that you might have and what to do about them, to health conditions and how to cure them. Dr. Berry is a medical doctor from Tennessee, and he's got a common sense approach to keto and a way of explaining things that even I can understand. So in this video, I'm gonna show you the top 10 things that I've learned from Dr. Ken Berry, and I think you'll be able to get a lot from it too. This is gonna be an information packed video, so I wanna get right into it. But I also wanna let you know that right down below, if there's a particular topic that you're interested in, and you want to know more about, I'm going to link all of Dr. Berry's videos right down below. I've tried to take a lot of the best videos that he has, condense them down a little bit, and I hope it helps you as much as it's helped me. And if you have any topics that I have not covered in this video, let me know down in the comments. I plan on doing a few more videos just like this. The first thing I want to include in this video is health conditions, and not necessarily the ones you might think about like diabetes and some of the other diseases. For example, skin tags. You know what they are, but do you know where they come from? Do you know how you can fix them? Let me let Dr. Berry explain. I want to discuss with you a skin sign that means something that you may not know that it meant that. Your doctor, in fact, may not know that there's a direct correlation between skin tags and a very, very dangerous metabolic syndrome. So what skin tags really mean? Uh, millions of people have skin tags. There looks like there may be a little bit of a genetic component. In other words, if your family has skin tags, then you may be a little more likely to have skin tags. Uh, there may be a viral component to this. We're not sure. But by far the vast majority of the cause of skin tags, especially if you have multiple skin tags. And uh, if you don't know what skin tags are, they're those little tags of skin. Usually you have them around your eyes. You can have them on your neck, under your armpits, in your groin area. Uh, dermatologists will tell you this is where skin rubs skin. But the problem with that theory is, is there are millions of people out there with eyelids and armpits and groins, and they don't have any skin tags at all. But their skin rubs together just like mine and yours. So there must be something else, something deeper going on. And they're benign. They're never cancer. You don't have to worry about that. But what you have to worry about is what's going on inside your body. The skin tag itself is not dangerous at all. But removing all the skin tags on your body does not remove the risk of the syndrome that's going on inside your body. Uh, the big danger from skin tags is metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, prediabetes, and type 2 diabetes. There is a direct association between the number of skin tags that you have on your body, regardless of where they're at, and your risk of developing hyperinsulinemia, prediabetes, and ultimately type 2 diabetes. There's also a direct relationship between the number of skin tags you have and being obese. But that's not because just being obese causes skin tags. It's because of the metabolic syndrome. That's what's causing your skin tags. But if they don't tell you, hey, you know, you can keep these from happening. You can actually reverse the ones that you already have and make them get smaller and smaller and go completely away. Uh, I don't mind chopping off skin tags all day. It pays very well, but I think you'd rather fix the underlying problem. And that's the fact that you're just eating too many carbohydrates and too many processed carbohydrates. There's actually a diet that tens of thousands of people have used to shrink or completely uh, reverse and remove their skin tags. And that is the low-carb, keto, carnivore, banting, 
Atkins diet. These diets all lower your blood sugar levels back to low normal. They lower your insulin levels back to low normal. And that, that gets rid of the hyperinsulinemia, gets rid of the blood sugar spikes. And then your skin tags just start to go away. Skin tags don't go away on their own if you're eating the standard American diet or a high carbohydrate diet. They just keep getting bigger and you keep getting more and more as years go by. And I know you don't want that. I had no idea about skin tags but I know I don't have them now. And so Dr. Barry's tips will help you get rid of them if you have them. The next thing that I wanna go into is a health condition that a lot of people don't even know they have. And if you do know about it or you have it, then you definitely wanna get rid of it. Before we get into Dr. Barry, I wanna play this about what fatty liver disease actually is. His doctor often told him to lose weight, but he never listened. Years ago, he developed fatty liver disease. Now he has liver cancer. It's estimated up to 40% of Canadians have the condition. This is what a normal liver looks like, and this one with fatty liver disease is enlarged and clogged with fat. The condition is caused by bad eating habits and a lack of exercise. It can lead to cirrhosis or cancer. So if that sounds like you, Dr. Barry's got some great advice here about what to do about it. Fatty liver and how to cure it. That's right, cure it. Get rid of it. You don't have it anymore, okay? Fatty liver disease is a huge epidemic in the US and the UK, Australia, Canada, Fatty liver, also called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or if, it's, if your liver's inflamed, we sometimes as doctors call it non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, okay? All these things mean basically the same thing, that your body has inappropriately stored fat in your liver. Huge risk factor for liver failure, for death, for heart disease. We'll get into all that 30 to 40% of adults in the US and in most Western society have fatty liver, three to four out of 10, right? That's nuts, that's ridiculous, okay? This is, and fatty liver self-inflicted, and I'm gonna tell you how to cure it, but three out of four uh, out of 10 people you know have fatty liver disease as an adult. What about kids? Of course kids don't have this, right? No, you're wrong. One out of every 10 kids in America, down to as young as three years old, depending on how terrible their diet is, can have fatty liver disease. Yeah, there are actually teenagers on the liver transplant list now because of their fatty liver disease. I mean, all doctors in America should literally hang their head in shame that this is occurring because it's entirely 100% preventable and 100% curable if you eat the right diet and do the things that I talk about later in this video. So how do you fix fatty liver? If you want to cure your fatty liver disease, you have to stop fructose. You have to stop sugars. You have to stop starches. You have to stop simple carbs. That's it. That is the cure. I'm not joking. You can literally turn off the video right now and go and make those changes in your life and cure your fatty liver. Fructose, whether it comes from a soft drink in the form of high fructose corn syrup or whether it comes from a delicious ripe organic peach, is digested completely differently in your body from other sugars and starches, okay? And it's highly likely it's going to be laid down as fat in your liver. So you got to get the fructose out of your life completely, but don't, don't just think it's fructose and nothing else, okay? Because, you know, sugar... Sugar is made up of glucose and fructose, right? So if anything is pre-sweetened, that's going to make your fatty liver worse or it's going to increase your risk of developing fatty liver disease, okay? The, all, the simple, all the starches, all the simple sugars, as soon as you eat them and your acid breaks them up and digests them, they turn into some combination of glucose and fructose. That's right, exactly right. Even the, sugar, the, star, the carbs in broccoli, break down ultimately <clears throat> into glucose and fructose, but they're so locked up in the fiber and they're so blended with great vitamins, minerals, and nutrients that I think it's okay to get those carbs in cruciferous vegetables, in leafy greens. I think those carbs are, are, are acceptable because they're so locked up in the fiber if you eat them raw or lightly steamed, and they're so filled with nutrition. One more thing you've got to get out of your life because it inflames your liver, which can cause your liver to lay down more fat than it might would otherwise, is the vegetable oil. And I do this because there's no vegetables in them, right? Canola, safflower, soybean oil, uh-uh. 
all those got to go, okay? They inflame your liver, and that's going to make your liver lay down fat, which you do not want. you got to cook your foods in real fats like bacon grease, lard, avocado oil, olive oil, butter, right? Those are the things you cook in. If you've got canola oil in your kitchen right now, pause this video, push the pause button, get up and go to the kitchen right now and throw that crap in the garbage because that's where it belongs. Do not buy pills, powders, supplements. <clears throat> None of that stuff is going to help your liver, okay? You don't need to add anything to this equation. You just need to subtract the poison. Get it out. So if you have or somebody you know has fatty liver disease, I really hope that helps you. I know once I got on the ketogenic diet, my liver function greatly, greatly improved. The next thing I want to talk about is something you see all over the TV, and it affects men and women. And it's low testosterone or low T. Just like you've seen on this commercial. You guys look great. Once I turn 40, let me guess, less energy? Less drive? Definitely. It's not your fault. It happens to every man. Testosterone levels drop as you age. Happened to you guys? Yep. So what did you do? We, we got, got Eugenics, Eugenics Total, Total tea. tea. So do you want to take a pill for that? Or how about trying something like this? Popeye, watch out! I mean numbers. It's give me spinach. Mm -hmm. Disco makes me tough. If neither one of those options looks good to you, Let's see what Dr. Barry has to say about it and how I can fix this in a much better way. If you're a man, you want to have your testosterone levels optimized. You want them to be as high as you can get them naturally. Some men even need to use exogenous testosterone that they get from their doctor. Number one, and most importantly, spend most of your time and most of your money here, is eat enough fat. Testosterone, the molecule, comes from a molecule you may have heard of before called cholesterol. It is the backbone of all the sex hormone molecules. Without cholesterol, you can't make testosterone. So stop being afraid of fat. We now know that the cholesterol theory of heart disease is dumb. It's over. It's had its heyday and it's over. We all know it's not true. So now that you're not afraid of cholesterol anymore, you can eat enough fat so that you can actually bump up your testosterone level a little with tip number one. Tip number two is you need to greatly reduce the amount of sugar, starch, and simple carbohydrates that you eat. Okay, tip number three is you've got to, got to, got to decrease the stress in your life. Now, I don't mean good stress. If you're an entrepreneur and you own a business and you're trying to make that successful, that's a good stress. That's good. Now, you need to find ways to manage that stress so that it doesn't become chronic bad stress, but you don't, you've don't. you got to decrease the bad stress in your life. The next is high-intensity interval training. That's tip number four. You want to lift heavy every now and then. You want to run as fast as you can every now and then. Search in YouTube for high-intensity interval training or HIIT You'll find all kinds of videos that, that you can watch, and you'll realize you don't have to join the gym to do this. You can literally get up off the, the couch, and you can go outside in your running shoes, and you can do high-intensity interval training. Now, tip number five is some supplements you'll want to know about. The first one is zinc. Zinc is very important for men. We need somewhere between 25 and 50 milligrams a day. You can definitely get that from the foods you eat if, you're, if you strategically eat certain foods, or you can just take a supplement that's 25 or 50 milligrams a day. And what that does is it helps push anything that bleeds over into the estrogen pathway back into the testosterone pathway, right? The next is magnesium. There are several studies that show that that enough magnesium will raise your testosterone level a little bit. And then the third one is vitamin D. Go out in the sun and get some vitamin D. And if you can't get sun, then take a good quality vitamin D supplement. Vitamin D is actually a pro-hormone or a pre-hormone. It helps all of your sex hormones and your other hormones to form. Tip number six intermittent fasting. And you're like, wait a minute, not eating will raise my testosterone? Yeah. More than one study has shown that when you intermittent fast for 18 to 20 hours a day, you actually increase both your testosterone and your HGH. There's that one again. So your human growth hormone and your testosterone level both go up when you fast. Number seven is lose some weight. If you're overweight at all, the adipose tissue on your body and especially the adipose tissue inside your belly that kind of gives you that pot belly is going to not only lower your testosterone level, 
But adipose tissue inside your belly acts like estrogen, basically. It's more complicated than that, but it's very estrogen-like in the way it affects the human male body. You've got to get the xenoestrogens out of your life. What the heck is a xenoestrogen? Basically, you don't ever want to drink or eat anything that is in plastic if it's hot. So if you left your water bottle in the truck and it's it's 120 degrees in there, don't drink that water, okay? That is going to have estrogen mimicking plastics in the water. Don't heat up your coffee in styrofoam or a plastic cup. Don't put your soup in a plastic bowl and put it in the microwave. So I hope that sheds some light on three health conditions that you or someone you know has or wants to fix. Make sure you share this video too if you know someone that this could help. Now this next topic kind of goes right alongside with health conditions because some of these can actually cause health conditions. I'm talking about nutritional deficiencies. And the first one that I want Dr. Barry to get into is vitamin D deficiencies, what that looks like, and what you can do to fix it. Now, some of you may are, have already caught on to the vitamin D epidemic of low vitamin D in the US and Canada, but many of you have not, and that's what I wanna talk about today. Vitamin D is a big deal. If your levels are low chronically, it can lead to suffering, early disease, and early death. And so we want to avoid those three things all we can. The number one sign that your vitamin D might be low is bone aches, okay? If your bones ache, not your joints, but your actual bones themselves, that's actually, if your vitamin D is low, that's a condition called osteomalacia, which means painful bones. Sign number two is chronic fatigue. And I know, I know, I know, that's the sign of about a thousand different possible conditions. But if you go see your doctor for chronic fatigue, one of the very things first things he should check is a vitamin D25 level to see if your level's low. The next is if you have a, a fracture, a broken bone from just a little bit of force. Uh, if you step off the curb and break your ankle, if you fall and break your wrist on carpet, right? If you just like fall off the couch and break your wrist, that's not normal. Human beings are made to bounce, not to break. So if you have a, a broken bone for no real reason, like if you're coughing a lot from bronchitis and you break a rib, that's not normal. You, that shouldn't happen. You probably have low vitamin D. Four, if you have frequent viral infections, like it seems like you have a cold every 10 minutes, right? Or you just have just repetitive infections way more often than your friends do, that could be a sign of low vitamin D because keeping your vitamin D where it needs to be can actually protect you from infection. If you have, number five, if you have depressed mood, more and more research is coming out to show that vitamin D is very uninflammatory, both for your brain and for other body tissues. And that, and so one of the things that you could have is a depressed mood if your vitamin D is very low. So part of the workup for depression when you go to your doctor should be some blood work. And within that blood work should be a vitamin D 25 level checked. Number six is slow wound healing. If you get a cut or an abrasion and it seems like it just takes forever to heal, <clears throat> if it seems like you heal far slower than your friends and family, then you may have low vitamin D. Vitamin D is in charge of hundreds of biochemical reactions in your skin and in other parts of your body. And your skin just doesn't heal as effectively if your vitamin D is low. You have muscle aches. Just your muscles ache for no real reason. Now, if you, you know, if you walked 10 miles yesterday and that's the first time you've done that in years, it makes sense that your muscles would ache. But if your muscles ache all the time and there's no real reason for it, you may have low vitamin D. Number eight is basically if you live in the U.S. and Canada, and this is a bonus, if you live in the U.K., if you live in the U.S., if you live in Canada, if you live anywhere up in the higher latitudes, you don't get enough sun. To get more sun, if you can't do that, then, take a, then you can get more vitamin D in a good ketogenic diet. If you're eating grass-fed butter, that has vitamin D. If you're eating uh, the egg yolks from chickens who are able to run around in the yard and eat bugs and worms, those egg yolks have vitamin D3, right? Uh, so butter, and then if you're able to eat pork that's been pasture raised and, and actually was allowed to run around and eat grub worms and acorns and other good things and play out in the sun all day, that pork will have good vitamin D. And so I'd much prefer you get your vitamin D from the sun and from your diet. But if you just have to have a supplement, then make sure you're taking a good vitamin D 
supplement, not D2. So if you can't get it from the sun and you can't get it from your diet, then take a supplement. And some people need to get it from the sun, from their diet, and take a supplement. It's up to you. You decide which which one of those people you are. But if you do take a supplement, make sure it's vitamin D3. Make sure it's in a in an oil-filled gel cap. And make sure that the oil they use is not soybean or canola oil. The next thing I want to get into is magnesium deficiency. Just about everyone in the United States has this. But what does it look like? What are the symptoms? And what can we do about it? Check this out. It's very common in the U.S. and Canada, the U.K. and Australia to be deficient in magnesium. But wait a minute. My doctor checked my magnesium level and said it was normal. So what about that, Dr. Barry? So here's the thing. At any given time in your body, only 1% of your available magnesium is present in your blood or in the serum. It is an essential nutrient. It's an essential mineral. It's an element. Your body can't make elements. You have to ingest them. And so you have to either eat good magnesium-rich foods or take a magnesium supplement or both for some people, or you're just not going to get enough. Over 50% of the U.S. population, some experts estimate, are deficient, at least to some degree, in magnesium. If you have just an overall low energy level, that could be any number of medical issues. But magnesium is vital in one of the rate limiting steps for the production of ATP. Another is tachycardia or fast heart rate. Calcium tends to make your heart contract and magnesium tends to make your heart relax. And if you don't have enough magnesium, then your heart won't relax as it should during the, the contraction relaxation cycle and you can wind up with a fast heart rate. Another is numb or tingling in the fingers or toes. Now, again, this can be caused by multiple other medical issues. If you're having this, go see your doctor. But also, I would recommend either eating more magnesium-rich foods or taking a magnesium supplement. Now, a big one probably you guys all know is muscle cramps or muscle twitches. You know that little twitch you get right here when that in-law comes over? Well, it could be the in-law. It could also be low magnesium, okay? And especially if you're having Charlie horses in the middle of the night, it's either magnesium or potassium almost all the time. Another big one that most of you guys already know about is constipation. Magnesium will help with constipation like no other element really will. And so if you're chronically constipated, magnesium might be a big help in your life. Another is insomnia. You may have heard of this as well. Magnesium is not a knockout drug. Magnesium is not habit forming. You cannot sell magnesium on the black market. But if you'll take anywhere from 400 to 800 milligrams of magnesium at bedtime, plus or minus a little melatonin, you'll drift off into a more restful sleep and you'll stay asleep through the night for more minutes or more hours and get a more restful night's sleep. Another is if you've been diagnosed with osteoporosis or osteopenia, uh, osteopenia is just the, the beginning weakness of bone and you haven't progressed to osteoporosis yet, which is very brittle bones. Your body has to have magnesium and calcium in the proper ratio in order to store calcium properly in the bones. And so if you are very low in magnesium, you may not be putting away and rebuilding bone properly. And that can lead to, to brittle bones or osteoporosis. Porosis. And so if you've been diagnosed with that, then you definitely need to look into getting more magnesium in your diet and in your life. Another is high blood pressure. Now, often high blood pressure is just high blood pressure, but sometimes it's low magnesium. And even if you are taking a blood pressure medication, I still advise taking 400 to 800 milligrams of magnesium at bedtime every night. That's going to help your blood pressure be lower naturally. And then you may not need as much of the prescription blood pressure medication, right? Another is arrhythmias and even atrial fibrillation or AFib. A lot of these arrhythmias are caused by low magnesium levels. The final one I want to talk about is one that if, if you've been pregnant and you had a little bit of morning sickness, that's normal. That's normal to have that because of the fluctuating hormones. But if you had severe morning sickness or you know someone who's pregnant and just has debilitating morning sickness, there are a couple of studies that actually show that a magnesium supplement makes that much less severe. And so it looks like severe morning sickness may be due in part to a magnesium deficiency. In a world where we hear every day about sodium, reducing your sodium, sodium causes high blood pressure. Sodium causes you to retain water. Sodium causes hypertension, which 
It's the same as high blood pressure. I already said that. Anyway, do you need to cut down your sodium? Or is sodium one of the things that you have to have? Let me let Dr. Barry explain this. I'm not a medical doctor. He is, and he has a great understanding of it. Let's get into that. How much salt should you include in your diet to optimize your health? So how much salt should you eat? How much is too much? How much is not enough? These questions have been plaguing human medicine and nutrition for decades. Several health organizations recommend that you severely restrict your salt intake, so much to the point where your food is bland and yucky. Uh, one of the biggest organizations is the American Heart Association. They recommend that you just look at the salt shaker, but don't actually use it. Uh, other regulatory bodies like the World Health Organization and the Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommend that you restrict your salt intake to the point where your diet is actually painful to eat. Now, if you like videos like this, make sure you hit that subscribe button right down there that lit up for you. And anytime I do a new video like this, you'll know about it. In this first graphic, what we're looking at here on the left-hand side of this graph, that's your health risk. And that's from all causes of, of things that could harm your health, from the lowest health risk all the way up to the highest health risk. And then the, the bottom part of the graph is the amount of sodium you eat each day. So you can see over on the left-hand side is the amount of sodium that the American Heart Association recommends that you ingest each day. And you can see that it is associated with a, the highest risk to your health. Yeah, see that? Now, the World Health Organization is not so strict on sodium intake, but they're still much more strict than they should be. You can see where they say your salt intake should lie. Still a very high risk to your health. The Dietary Guidelines for Americans, the DGA, they're not quite as stringent as the AHA and the WHO, but they're still recommending that you restrict your salt intake. Now, at the very bottom where this, the, the curve you see dips down to its lowest, that's where you're going to reap the, have the lowest health risk or where your health is going to be the best. And that looks like it's between three and five grams of sodium intake per day. Now, that's way more than the American Heart Association recommends you eat, way more than the World Health Organization, and way more than the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. So how in the world is the American Heart Association getting it so wrong? This is a different way of graphing out the same exact information. So the blue dots and the blue line associated with them is a healthy life expectancy at birth. And then the red dots and the red line associated with that is the all-cause mortality. So dying from any reason, that's the red line. And then down at the bottom of this graph is sodium intake in grams per day. So you can see the red dotted line, that's the American Heart Association's recommendations. Uh, you can see that it is associated with a lower life expectancy, and with a higher all-cause mortality. And then there's the World Health Organization recommendations, and then there's the European Society of, of Cardiology. Their recommendations are much more reasonable than the AHAs, but still you can see that when you're eating four or five or six grams of sodium each and every day, your life expectancy is going to go up and your risk of dying from any cause is going to go down. It's almost like your body knows how much sodium you need. And it's almost like your body wants you to ignore the idiotic advice from the American Heart Association to severely restrict your sodium intake. I think these two graphs make it very, very clear that you should ignore the AHA and all these other regulatory bodies because their advice is stupid and is not based on any meaningful research. I have the hypothesis that if you are eating a low carbohydrate diet that's filled with real human food, a proper human diet, if you will, that you're able to eat much more salt that basically the sweet spot where you're gonna have the least mortality and the longest life expectancy and the, the greatest health outcomes is going to expand towards the right of both of these 
And I would predict that you would see that, that humans are going to have exemplary health and very low rates of mortality if they're ingesting somewhere between four and 10 grams of sodium a day if you're eating a very low carbohydrate, proper human diet. And you need to salt your food to taste. Eating salt is not going to give you high blood pressure. Eating salt is not going to cause heart failure. None of those things are true. Stop believing the lies. And the third part that I want to get into is starting the keto or carnivore diet. Dr. Barry has helped thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people start the keto or carnivore diet. And let's start with carnivore and some of the mistakes that you do not want to make on a carnivore diet. Now the carnivore diet is, a, is the ultimate low carb diet. It is a subset of a ketogenic diet. Uh, most people's ketogenic diet limits total carbohydrates to 20 total grams a day or under. The carnivore diet turns down your carbohydrate intake knob as far down as you can possibly take it. Number one is forgetting that seafood, eggs and butter are carnivore. So many people think, oh, it's just red meat. It's just steak. It's just ground meat. That's, that's what carnivore is. <clears throat> if something is a part of an animal, was a part of an animal, or it is a product produced by an animal, it is technically carnivore. Number two is eating too lean of a diet. Many of us come to this way of eating with the mantra of avoid fat at all costs. Eating fat will make you fat. Those are just not true, but you may have that in your subconscious. So you may tend to unconsciously pick leaner cuts of meat for your carnivore diet. Not only is it absolutely unnecessary, it can be quite detrimental to your progress and to your success. Number three is not getting enough electrolytes. You have to understand our ancestors drank river water, stream water, mud puddle water. These are all rich sources of electrolytes, but they're also uh, can cause a nasty infection these days. So we want you to avoid probably drinking mud puddle water. Find a good source of electrolytes that you can add to your diet. Number four is not getting enough omega-3 fatty acids. Now, we, we're really concerned with any spectrum of the proper human diet that you get a correct omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid ratio. The average American is eating a 20 to one or a 30 to one omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, very unhealthy, very inflammatory. Just the fact that you've eliminated all the industrial vegetable oils from your diet, that's gonna lower your omega-6 fatty acid intake a bunch. Number five is organ meat. I know, I know, you may currently think it's gross, but I promise you, as your palate matures and kind of becomes a, a proper human palate, you're gonna to start to understand that uh, that you can eat organ meats and they're actually tasty. One of the one of the gateway ways to eat uh, organ meat is a liver pate or a liver mousse or even liver worst that you buy at the store. These are excellent ways to start to incorporate some organs. Number six on this list is not getting enough collagen. And no, no, dummy, I don't mean collagen powder. That's not okay. That's a waste of money and you're, the, the origin of that collagen is always suspect. Is So if you're eating eggs, there's a little membrane between the white of the egg and the yolk. That's pure collagen, okay? If you're eating ribs, whether pork, beef, or sheep, there is a membrane on the back of the ribs that most people peel off and throw away. That's pure collagen. Don't do that. If you're eating steak, eat the gristle. That's pure collagen. Is sauces, marinades, rubs, and gravy. So if you've been eating a standard Western diet and you start carnivore, you may think, well, gosh, I've always put ketchup on meatloaf, so obviously that's how you eat meatloaf. No, no, no. You have to you have to watch sauces and rubs and marinades and gravies very, very carefully. Eating out uh, thoughtlessly, so it's okay to eat out if you're if you're a ingredient detective, and you are upfront with your weight service and tell them right off the bat, look, I'm allergic to sugar, I'm allergic to any grains, and I'm allergic to vegetable oil then you're gonna get a clean grill that your meat's prepared on. They're not gonna put any sauces or gravies or marinades or rubs on your meat because they don't want you to have an allergic reaction in the restaurant because that's bad for business. Number 10 is quitting carnivore too soon. For, the, for most people that I get feedback from, it takes four to eight weeks of eating strict carnivore in order to really start to notice the, the awesome results that come from eating a carnivore diet. 
So don't do it for a week or two and then ass out. I promise you, you're missing out on something that's very powerful. Number 11 is portion restricting. Now, definitely if you're coming to this way of eating to try to lose stored fat, it has been pounded into your head that you only need to eat a palm-sized portion of this and a thumb-sized portion of this. When you're eating carnivore, all bets are off. You do not have to do that. You can eat until you are comfortably stuffed. And so if an eight ounce ribeye does not fill you up completely, get the 10 ounce. If that doesn't do it, get the 16 ounce bone-in cowboy ribeye, okay? You can eat as much meat as you want. You can add egg yolks, you can add butter, you can add, you can cook it in as much beef tallow or bacon grease as you want. You get to eat until you're comfortably full. If you don't do that, then you won't be getting enough fat. You won't be getting enough total energy in your diet. That's really going to put you back into having the fatigue and the other problems that people have if they try to portion control on carnivore. That is not necessary. Watch out for processed meat. Now, if processed meat is all you can afford, that's still infinitely better than eating the Cheetos and the Doritos, okay? So don't feel like if all you can afford is bologna and hot dogs and spam, do carnivore with that, but realize that's not a perfect carnivore, but you gotta watch the ingredients. Uh, for example, if you just look at the 20 different choices of hot dogs or wieners in a rest in a uh, supermarket, they could range anywhere from having three grams of carbohydrate per hot dog down to virtually zero grams. You gotta watch for grains because if they add grains and sugar to a hot dog, for the average person, it's gonna taste better and it's gonna be cheaper to make. So look at the total carb count of what you're about to buy and if it's more than one gram, try to find a better source. Is salt restriction. I know, I know, your doctor and your di dietitian and your mama all told you that salt is bad for you, you should limit salt. There's just no basis in scientific fact or paleoanthropological evidence to support that. All mammals love salt and crave salt and will walk for miles to eat as much salt as they want from a uh, salty rock or salty mud. Our ancestors in the past always made use of the blood and the organs and the marrow, all which are very high in sodium salt. So stop being afraid of salt. You wanna use a good, reliable, natural salt. Uh, my favorite is Redmond's Real Salt. It comes from an extinct ocean that's protected under hundreds of feet of bentonite clay. So there are no microplastics or nanoplastics in Redmond's Real Salt. There are other good brands out there that are protected thusly. Number 14 is cooking too much. You don't wanna overcook your meat. So if you're currently a well done person, I don't want you to overnight start eating uh, medium rare, but you gotta start cooking your meat less and less. The longer you cook meat, the more you break down the vitamins in the meat, and probably you're breaking up other important micronutrients as well. Don't overcook your meat. You have this very sophisticated infection control device on your body, it's called a nose. And so when you take the meat out of the packet, you smell it, it smells super fresh. You take the salmon out, you smell it, it smells super fresh. Same goes for fish roe. Anything that you're gonna eat raw, if you're gonna make steak tartare, you want that meat to be very fresh and to smell very good. That's what your nose is for, is to protect you from eating ruined meat. Because I promise you, if, if an egg yolk or if, if a piece of meat or if some fish roe is, is bad, your nose is gonna let you know and you shouldn't eat that. And this is the one that's a little inflammatory. It may irritate some people, especially if they make uh, thousands of dollars a month selling supplements, is you don't need to take a lot of supplements on a carnivore diet. Meat, especially organ meat, especially egg yolks, especially pastured butter, are the most nutrient dense foods on the planet. If you put up a piece of beef liver nutritionally against uh, the same weight of kale or spinach, the beef liver is going to blow the kale out of the water. Kale's not nowhere near superfood compared to, to liver, any liver, chicken liver, beef liver, goose, it doesn't matter. Liver is a multivitamin superfood. The same goes for egg yolks. If you compare the nutrition in a pastured egg yolk with any plant-based food on the planet, the egg yolk is gonna win every single time. You 100% don't need to take a fiber supplement, although some people think they do. If you're having gut symptoms, then you definitely don't wanna take a fiber supplement. Carnivore is gonna fix your gut symptoms, whether that's irritable bowel, 
uh, both diarrhea and constipation based irritable bowel, whether that's ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, or any other of the hundreds of gut conditions, carnivore is going to make it better unless you add a fiber supplement. You also don't need a vitamin C supplement or really any other vitamin supplement, especially if you're eating organs. Uh, all the livers contain a little bit of vitamin C. <clears throat> And we don't need as much vitamin C when we're carnivore. And the way you can know this is true is you can look at the tens and tens of thousands of carnivores who are eating according to my list. And they're not just eating uh, deli meat that's full of the crap. They never develop a vitamin C deficiency. They never develop scurvy. Their teeth are, are strong and beautiful. Their skin is is strong and beautiful and snaps back. Their bones don't become brittle and break because they're getting more than enough vitamin C in a well-formulated carnivore diet. Now, if you've watched my channel for any length of time, you know it's about taking foods that you love and making them keto, low carb, and healthy. But sometimes I like to do a reset. And when I do, it's beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. Something that Dr. Barry is the first person that I heard talk about and something that I use in my life all the time. Well, not all the time, when I'm not eating my favorite foods. Well, maybe all the time, because I love beef, I love bacon, I love butter, and I love eggs. Let me let Dr. Barry explain this a little better. For the next few minutes, I wanna discuss with you an extreme weight loss hack. Now, this hack may not be for everybody, but it's definitely for those people who have either a lot of weight to lose or who have tried multiple diets and didn't lose any weight or lost only a little and then gained it all back. And so if you want to lose a lot of fat off your body while at the same time keeping your muscles keeping your bones strong, keeping your brain working very well and all your internal organs very healthy, this may be the extreme diet hack for you. Think that if you have given up on losing fat and you just think that it's not possible for you, this may be the diet hack for you. Now, this diet hack is very safe. There's no danger in doing this. The, the foods that you'll be eating on this diet, you can get from your local grocery store. There's no unique, weird, proprietary ingredients you have to buy. There's no subscription you have to sign up for. You just eat these foods and avoid all other foods and food-like products. Uh, what this diet hack is going to do is going to hack two of your hormones. Actually, more than that, but we're going to just focus on two in this video. The first and most important is your insulin level. Insulin has hundreds of jobs in the human body, but one of its main jobs is to take energy in the form of glucose and, and other sugar molecules and store them as fat. And so anytime your insulin level is very high, you're going to be storing fat and it's going to be very, very hard for you to burn the fat that you've already stored. And as you can see, immediately the, uh, a chronically high insulin level is going to prevent you from losing any weight. The second hormone that we're going to hack is your growth hormone, your human growth hormone. By keeping it high, this diet hack is going to protect your muscle and actually help you put on new muscle if you'd like to work out and do that. But you're not going to lose muscle because when we talk about losing weight, we don't really mean that. What we mean is I want to lose fat. And so if you'd like to keep your muscle mass and you'd like to keep your bone density and keep everything else right where it is while losing fat, this is probably the diet hack for you. We're also going to keep your blood sugar level very, very low. And so if you are a type 2 diabetic or a pre-diabetic or you're insulin resistant, you may notice that your blood sugars come back down to normal levels eating this diet. If so, there's no extra charge for that. Really, there's about five or six things you can eat. And the, the beautiful thing about this diet is it's not a calorie restriction diet. It's not a portion control diet. So of the foods I'm about to name off, you can literally eat as much as you want within the, the kind of the ramifications I'm going to tell you. Okay, here's the list of foods you can eat as much as you want. Number one, beef. You can eat ground beef. You can eat ribeye. You can eat uh, less expensive cuts of beef. Any beef meat, the meat, uh, any meat from a cow, you can eat as much as you want. Any meat from a sheep, you can eat as much as you want. So lamb chops, uh, any of that kind of stuff, you can eat as much as you want. Any meat from goat, you can eat as much as you want. So any ruminant, but let's just let's just call all those beef 
for the sake of simplicity in this video. So you can eat all the beef you want. You can eat all the eggs you want. And please don't throw away those yolks. They're full of magical nutrition. If you're going to throw away anything, throw away the white. But eat your eggs. Next is butter. Next is liver. And when I say liver, I mean really all organ meats that come from an animal. And most people, that's, that's liver is what you can get at your local grocery. But if you have access to heart, if you have access to brain, if you have access to other things like that, uh, bone marrow, you're welcome to eat as much as you want of those as well. And then finally is bacon. Yes, bacon. You can lose weight eating bacon. And so let's go over those again. Beef of any kind. Eggs of any kind, they can be duck eggs, chicken eggs, quail eggs, probably lizard eggs. I'm not sure about li lizard eggs. You can eat butter, and you want to try to get grass-fed butter if you can. You can eat liver or other, other organ meats from animals, and you can eat bacon. And I don't want you to spend lots of extra money for the uncured bacon. Uncured bacon actually has more nitrates than cured bacon in it. Now, you can use salt to taste. Do not limit your salt. You can use as much salt as you'd like. You can drink water, either still or sparkling. Either one is fine. You can drink coffee and you can drink tea on this diet. And you can have as much of those as you'd like. What you're not going to ingest is any other foods. And you're going to do this diet hack for at least one month solid. And you can do it for up to three months if you'd like. But if for at least one month to get the full benefits of this, then you can do that. And all these foods I've listed, you can eat as much as you want. If you want a ribeye and three eggs for dinner, you can do that. If you'd like two eggs or, or two ribeye and six eggs, you can also do that. That's fine. There's no limit on the amount of food that you can eat. The only restriction is, is I want you to eat either one very large meal a day or two very large meals a day and try to eat these meals within a six hour window of time so that for 18 hours of the day you're not eating anything and then within the six hour window you can eat either one big meal or two big meals and I don't want you to eat just a small serving to be done I want you to eat until you're comfortably stuffed with these foods you're not going to limit your salt but you are going to eliminate any sweeteners from your diet. You're not going to use any meats that are breaded. You're not going to eat anything else like that. You're going to avoid all carbohydrates in this diet. I think that you'll find that you're going to feel better in just a few days on this diet, keeping in mind that if you do have a sugar or a carbohydrate addiction, you're going to have to withdraw from those things that you're addicted to. And withdrawing from any addiction, it takes anywhere from 7 to 14 days to kind of get over all the symptoms of withdrawal from that addiction, fatigue, headache, achiness, not feeling good, being sleepy or having trouble sleeping, either one of those. But you may do that if you have a sugar addiction or a carbohydrate addiction. That doesn't mean there's anything in this diet that's hurting you. It just means you're breaking that addiction and that may not be fun for a few days. Make sure that you're eating plenty of salt and also getting plenty of potassium and magnesium. Now, the ingredients I listed on this diet have those in them. But if you'd like to make sure you're getting your potassium, magnesium, sodium, and chloride. So that's it in a nutshell. You're going to eat as, as close to zero grams of carbohydrate as you can every day. You're gonna, But you're not going to calorie restrict. You're not going to portion restrict. You're going to eat until you're comfortably stuffed in your one or two meals a day. So I think you'll find that this diet ha will work when you have failed on many other diets. Now, at the end of the month or at the end of the three months, if you, if you think, man, I feel so much better and I'm getting all these wonderful results, I'd like to do this diet for a little longer. Is that safe? Yes, you can actually do this diet for as long as you'd like. I've been eating this diet for about the, the last 14 months now, and I feel better now at 50 than I felt when I was 35. I've actually lost body fat that I didn't think I'd ever be able to lose. I've lost body fat on this diet, which is called the carnivore diet, that I couldn't even lose on a ketogenic diet. And so for some people like me who are very insulin resistant, you have to turn down that carbohydrate knob to almost zero in order to lose the fat that you never thought you'd be able to lose. So beef, bacon, butter, and eggs is a great thing to do for a week before you get into some of my recipes or anytime you feel like you need a reset or get stuck. It's a good thing to do. Now I'm going to let Dr. Barry explain carnivore basics. And don't worry for all my keto folks, which 
IR one. I've got another video on Dr. Berry and keto. I'm gonna link it right up here. Have you heard of the carnivore diet yet? It's becoming quite popular because of the amazing transformations in both health and weight loss that people experience when they give it a try. In this longer video, I'm gonna try to give you a comprehensive list of everything that you should consider and plan for when starting a carnivore diet. Uh, number one is commit to a time period to do this. And there's several reasons why. I started the carnivore diet as a 30-day challenge on my Facebook page. And at the end of that month, I felt so much better, even over and above carnivore, I mean, even over and above keto, that I decided to do it for an additional month or two. And I just kept tacking on months until we're probably at 18, 19 months now. But some people notice some of the benefits of a carnivore diet almost immediately, within days. Other benefits take weeks, if not months, to um, materialize. And so I would encourage you to do at least a 30-day carnivore challenge, if not a 60 or 90-day, depending on what health or weight issues you have. Uh, next is to, when you do eat a carnivore meal, is to eat until you're comfortably stuffed. And for the first few days or weeks on carnivore, I want you to push this a little bit. I want you to actually try to eat more than you think that you should eat. Uh, this, there is no calorie counting. There is no portion control on a carnivore diet. There's really no macro counting on a carnivore diet. You are to eat as our ancestors did. When you're hungry, you sit down and eat and you eat until you're comfortably stuffed. Then you stop eating. So do not be, don't be saying, oh, I'll have a four ounce portion of this. Don't do any of that. Eat until you're comfortably stuffed. And in the first week or two, try to push that a little bit so that you're maybe even eating a little more. Because I think many of us, our entire life, we've been worried about portion size and calorie counts to where it's almost become an unconscious thing where we try to limit how much we eat. On a carnivore diet, you don't have to do that. You get to eat until you're comfortably stuffed. Next is I want you to eat anywhere from one time a day up to three times a day. Now, if you'll, if you'll follow the guideline I just gave you about eating to your stuffed, there won't be any snacking in between. And indeed, there shouldn't be any snacking. If you're used to three meals a day with snacks right now, then just say, okay, I'm going to eat three carnivore meals a day and I'm going to eat until I'm really stuffed and there's going to be no snacking in between. Now, many carnivores find that as the weeks go on, they forget a meal. And so they'll they'll convert to a two meals a day strategy. And that's totally fine if, if that's what happens to you. If you continue three meals a day, that's fine as well. Some carnivores will wind up just eating one very large meal a day because they're not hungry for the rest of the day. If that happens to you, that's fine, but that's definitely not a requirement. The next tip is to focus on fatty meat, whether this is fatty seafood or fatty cuts of land meat, you always wanna opt for a fattier cut. Uh, this, uh, I try to keep a one-to-one -one ratio between fat and protein in my carnivore diet one-to-one uh, -one with regards to the weight of what I'm eating. And I don't measure, I just guesstimate. And I think that's fine for, for you to do that as well. If if you feel like your, me your meal needs more fat, then add more fat. If you feel like it's too fatty, then add less fat next time. This is one of many things you get to play around with and experiment with on a carnivore diet. Now, the next, I think this is important, especially if you've been eating a high carbohydrate junk diet for years and years, is to transition slowly to carnivore. I don't think this should be a, a tomorrow I'm going 100% carnivore. I don't think that's necessary. And for many of you, I don't think that's probably ideal. You need to transition slowly over one to three weeks, maybe even a little longer. And I'll, I'll tell you more about why I think this is in a minute. But uh, there's bound to be some carbohydrate withdrawal symptoms if you're eating a high carbohydrate diet now, diet now. And I don't want those to hit you too hard and all at once because that can make it very hard to stick with a carnivore diet. The next tip is to give your stomach, your gallbladder, and your liver time to adapt to this. If you've been eating a high carbohydrate diet for years and a, and a very low 
fat diet for years, then your stomach has gotten lazy. Your stomach is supposed to have a very high acidity to your stomach acid. It should be uh, 1.3 to 2.0 on the pH scale, which is very, very acidic. But if you've been eating just grains and sugar and crap, then your stomach may have gotten used to just keeping a pH of three or four or five, and that's not going to be able to digest meat properly. So give your stomach time to ramp up its acid production. And if you're, if you're currently taking an acid blocker, you'll probably no longer need that on carnivore, and you'll need time for your stomach to, to start making that acid again. Your gallbladder, its function is to store and concentrate bile. If you've been eating a low-fat diet for years, then this, the smooth muscle in your gallbladder has gotten very weak and its, its storage and concentration abilities have probably already weakened a little bit as well. You need to give your gallbladder time to strengthen back up its smooth muscle because when you eat a high fat meal, your gallbladder has to contract very forcefully. Uh, some people have pain in the gallbladder for a few days or a few weeks when they start to ramp up the fat on a good healthy carnivore diet. This doesn't mean you should stop. It just means you need to give your gallbladder time to kind of blow out the sludge, strengthen up its smooth muscle, and ramp back up its ability to concentrate bile. Uh, next is to cook in animal fats. So throw away all the vegetable oils, all the shortening, all of that junk. That stuff is very inflammatory and bad for you. I want you to cook in beef tallow, in bacon grease, in butter or ghee. Uh, you need to use an animal fat to cook in. Bison tallow is also wonderful. These are, that's going to increase your fat to protein ratio. And it's also going to be a great source of uh, vitamins and minerals that you otherwise might not get in your diet. Next is to use plenty of real salt in your diet. Salt is not bad for you. It's good for you. I use Redmond's real salt because it's a, it's a very trustworthy salt that's protected from any kind of ocean pollution or any other kind of pollution. Do not be afraid of salt. Salt to taste. If your meat is not salty enough, add more salt. Uh, this is very, very important to help fight the carbohydrate withdrawal symptoms, but also to give your body enough sodium and chloride, both of which are essential elements that your body needs on a daily basis in order to function optimally. Do not be afraid of salt. Uh, another tip is I would clean out the pantry and the fridge, and I would tell my friends and family that I'm about to do a 90-day carnivore diet challenge to help improve my health. Uh, you may not even want to tell them you're doing it for weight loss. You may want to say, I, I, I feel like I can be healthier on this diet so that they'll be more apt to be on board with you. But if you've got carbs in the pantry or in the fridge or your family and friends aren't aware of this, they're going to be trying to shove carbs in your face. But if you, if you take these precautions, it makes it much easier to complete your 90 day challenge without messing up. Another tip is to focus on electrolytes and minerals. Having a good source of electrolytes and minerals is going to help you with the carbohydrate withdrawal symptoms that you'll probably experience. And it's also going to help you fight the cravings for junk food because very often cravings are a sign of a mineral deficiency. Carnivores have to think more about electrolytes because Back when you were eating a high carbohydrate diet, you were holding anywhere from five to 25 pounds of unnecessary, unhealthy fluid in your body. And that fluid stored some electrolytes just because that's the way fluids in your body work. When you started a low carb or a ketogenic or a carnivore diet, you diuresed away that extra unhealthy fluid. And you can ask anyone who started a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet, in the first week or two, they would lose anywhere from five to 20 pounds. That's not fat. That's just the fl unhealthy fluid that they're able to get rid of because they decreased their blood sugar and their insulin levels and their degree of chronic inappropriate inflammation. So they can get rid of all that fluid and urinate it away. With that fluid, because of the way the human kidney works, a lot of electrolytes have to go with that fluid. And that's why on a carnivore diet, you, you have to pay attention to your electrolytes. And I think it's very important to pay attention to the minerals as well. The next tip is to eat the highest quality meat that you can afford. If you can afford grass-fed, grass-finished, panda-massaged meat from the Himalayan mountains that, that are raised by monks, that's great. Buy that. That's good. 
that's going to be a little bit better than cheaper quality meat. But if all you can afford is hot dogs and bologna and potted meat and spam, you can still do a great carnivore diet on that as well. Always buy the best quality that you can currently afford and always be looking for higher quality. But there's no reason if, if your funds are limited that you can't not also benefit yourself from a very healthy carnivore diet. The next tip is don't forget about eggs. Don't forget about liver. Don't forget about seafood. Don't forget about shellfish. These are all carnivore. If, if anything, if any uh, food comes from an animal, that's carnivore, okay? And some people add insects. They eat crickets in their carnivore diet, and I think that's perfectly ancestrally appropriate. I personally don't do that, at least yet I don't. Uh, but do not forget these great sources of fat and protein. Eggs and liver. Liver is a superfood multivitamin. If you can find some kind of liver that you love and you eat that two or three times a week, that's going to be an excellent source of vitamins and minerals that otherwise you may just not have access to. Many people worry about uh, vitamin C deficiency, scurvy, and other vitamin deficiencies on a carnivore diet. But I know people who have been doing a carnivore diet for over a decade and they've not eaten a shred of plant food in that time, and they don't take supplements, and they have not developed scurvy or any other vitamin deficiency. Uh, there are several theories as to why this doesn't happen in carnivores, how, how they're able to be so healthy when they're not eating oranges or kiwi fruit for vitamin C. Uh, we don't know exactly why that is yet, but we just know it is so because there are thousands upon thousands of people who haven't eaten any plants, any source of that kind of vitamin C in over a decade, and they're doing fine. There is some vitamin C in liver uh, and other vitamins that are uh, present in fresh meat, but not quite in as high a quantity as it is in liver. That's why I really want you to find cod liver or chicken liver or beef liver, some kind of liver that you enjoy and make that part of your carnivore diet from day one. I think that's very, very important. The next tip is what to drink. I want you to drink water as much as you possibly can. I don't mean force water when you're not thirsty. I mean, try to make that the majority of what you drink. It can be still water or it can be sparkling water. I think that's fine. Uh, many carnivores drink black coffee or unsweetened tea as part of their carnivore diet, and they do great. I don't think uh, those things are off limits, although some carnivores might tell you otherwise. Uh, the next tip is to get to know your local butcher or your local meat department manager. Uh, the, and there's many, many reasons for doing this. They can t help you discover cuts of meat that you never knew existed. They can uh, also very often meat is shipped to your local butcher or meat department in bulk form, and then they cut it up. And in many cases, they'll trim off fat and throw it away. But if you're, if you're on a first name basis with your butcher or meat department manager, you can say, hey, don't trim that fat. Leave that fat on there. I want that. Or if you trim the fat off for other people, save that fat for me. I can cook with it or I can just fry it up and eat it. Uh, that's an excellent strategy. Uh, also, there are that, that this is a way that you can eat more nose to tail, which I'm highly in favor of. Um, often they'll throw cuts of meat away. Only recently did I discover oxtail or cow tail. And it's, if cooked properly, it's absolutely divine carnivore feast that's full of collagen and all kinds of joint building, uh, and repairing things in, in the, uh, the oxtail or the cow tail. So, Buddy up with your butcher or your meat department manager. That's very, very important, I think. The next tip is to seek out local sources for your carnivore diet. I promise you, if you'll just look, you will find someone who has chickens in their backyard, or you'll find a local rancher who has sheep or goats or cows or some other animal that they're happy to sell you that meat and it won't be as, as expensive as you think it might be. Uh, also, local sources, local ranchers are an excellent source for organ meats that you just may not be able to buy at your local supermarket. Try to focus on ruminant animals as the majority of your meat intake. So this would be cows, sheep, goats, 
venison, uh, any animal that has a is a ruminant that has a multiple chamber stomach. Magic happens inside that ruminant animal when they eat plants and turn that into tasty meat. And it seems that many carnivores just do better on a ruminant heavy diet. This is not to say that pork is bad or, or poultry is bad or seafood is bad, but most carnivores seem to, to experience their optimal physical shape and form and mental ability when they're focusing on ruminant meat uh, mostly. The next tip is to eat as nose to tail as possible. I think this is very, very important because of the vitamins and minerals I talked about earlier. I think it mirrors the way our ancestors ate animals. They never left the liver behind. They probably never left any organ behind. They ate all that. They cracked open the bones and got the marrow. They used a big rock to crack open the, the cranium and get the brain. They ate all that because though all those are excellent sources of nutrition. And we want to be the best shepherds we can for the animals and for our planet. And eating nose to tail, that that puts less waste out there, right? You're using that animal more completely. And I think that's a, a, a great way to honor that animal, that no part of it went to waste, and that you also gleaned the very meaningful nutrition in that organ meat as well. The next tip is to don't fret if you slip up. If you have friends come over and they bring a casserole and you're like, mm, and you eat that, don't worry about that one meal. What you don't want that meal to do is to turn into you falling off the wagon for a week or two or three. So if you do slip up at a meal or you, you eat something, you're like, oh crap, I thought that was zero carb and they added some sugar and I didn't know it. That don't, don't beat yourself up about that. Don't have negative thoughts about that. Just immediately refocus and recenter. Why am I doing this carnivore diet? What are my goals? And then get right back on the carnivore wagon and do not let that dissuade you from doing that. Next tip would be to consider a carnivore diet versus a ketovore diet. So a ketovore diet is when you eat a very, very meat heavy ketogen diet, but you still have some plants in there. Not many. Some people do better on a ketovore diet. Some people do better on just a meat-only carnivore diet. Uh, experiment and play around with that. Another experiment that I think you should play with is spices and rubs and condiments, onion, garlic. Some carnivores have to eliminate all that stuff and only use salt or mineral drops for their condiment. Other carnivores seem to do great by, they can use spices, they can use zero carb sugar-free rubs, they can put a little bit of uh, minced up garlic or onion with their meat and it doesn't seem to affect them or cause inflammation at all, but you may not be one of those carnivores. So you have to experiment with that yourself. Another thing to experiment with on a carnivore diet is your protein to fat ratio. I personally do better when I get the fat ratio as high as I possibly can. And I'll do this by cooking in animal fat, by adding butter to, to the meat. Uh, and I, I often I'll give the little center cut that's just pure lean meat. I'll slice that up and give it to our dogs who are also carnivore because I like the fattier cuts. And I feel like that mentally and physically, I do better when I focus on those fatty cuts. Another experiment that you can do on your carnivore diet is dairy. Some people on a carnivore diet do great with heavy cream in their coffee and they use butter and ghee. They Some carnivores even do great with full fat dairy in the form of kefir or yogurt, sour cream, cream cheese. But I would caution you to only use full fat and then if you're getting some benefits from your carnivore diet, but it's not as uh, ground shattering as you thought it was going to be, you might want to try a month dairy free or only dairy free with only butter and ghee as your only, only dairy sources because they are effectively the pure fat from the dairy. They don't have any of the proteins of dairy, which some carnivores find to be inflammatory. Another thing I really would um, counsel you to do when you start your carnivore diet is to save every bone from every meal. And I don't care if it's ruminant bones or if it's pork, chicken, even fish bones, get a gallon sized Ziploc bag and keep that in your freezer. All bones go into the bone bag in the freezer. And then once or twice a week when your bag gets full, use all those bones, plus or minus some spices, plus or minus some onion and garlic, 
uh, via our previous experiment and make delicious bone broth. Not only is it amazingly delicious, but you'll be able to unlock more minerals and vitamins that are locked up in the marrow and inside the bone itself that, that you would otherwise waste. Again, we're, we're honoring the nose to tail, honoring of the animal, and we're getting the maximum nutrition out of that animal by eating more nose to tail. I just felt it was important to get into carnivore a little bit on this one because a lot of people are starting it and it is the basics for keto. And if you find carnivore is not for you, then check out my videos because of course, they're mostly all keto. And I like to take the foods you love and make keto versions so that you don't have to deprive yourself. So for my friends out there with diabetes that are trying to reverse it by eating a ketogenic or carnivore diet, there are five breakfasts you just don't wanna eat. Here's Dr. Barry to tell you all about them. Diabetics listening to this now, I want you to pay careful attention to this. I want you to use your glucometer or your CGM, your continuous glucose monitor, to verify what I'm saying. I don't want you to blindly believe what the Amer American Diabetes Association says. I also don't want you to blindly believe me. I want you to listen to your body and the way you do that as a diabetic is to check your blood sugar, okay? So 30 minutes after you eat this breakfast, 60 minutes and 90 minutes, for the first time you try the breakfast that I recommend versus the breakfast that the ADA or other uh, diabetic gurus recommend, check your blood sugar at 30 minutes, 60 minutes, and 90 minutes after that meal. That's gonna give you the answer. Number one good food is eggs. When you eat an egg or two or five, you get all the amino acids and all of the fatty acids, both of these being essential fatty acids and amino acids. That means you can't make them. You have to get them in your diet. Number one bad food is oatmeal. Oatmeal is made of oats. And whether it's instant oatmeal or it's that kind of oatmeal that's steel cut that you have to cook on the stove for three days, it is made of carbohydrates, made of a grain. Number two, good food is avocado. An avocado has 500 milligrams of potassium per 100 gram serving. It also has only eight grams of carbohydrates per 100 gram serving. The number two bad food, which is a banana. Bananas are touted from the heavens as the ultimate source of potassium that you can get in your diet. This is utter foolishness. Number three good food is bacon. If you want to get uncured bacon, that's fine. If you want to eat the cheap bacon from China Mark, that's also fine. You're going to be getting the full assortment of essential amino acids and essential fatty acids from bacon. Number three bad food is English muffins. Some of the nutrition experts out there seem to think that if a bread is harder to chew or tougher, that somehow makes it a, a better carbohydrate. English muffins are made from wheat. Wheat is all carbohydrate. It breaks down into glucose and fructose. One raises your blood sugar, the other puts fat in your liver. Number four, good food for breakfast for diabetics is steak. Any grass-fed, grass-finished, or the cheapest steak you can buy at China Mart is gonna give you the full assortment of essential amino acids, the full assortment of essential fatty acids, and tons of vitamins and minerals. So even the cheapest, uh, worst produced steak is full of vitamins and minerals. There just is no arguing that. Number four, bad food is muesli with berries. Muesli is basically raw oats that we call by a different name so you don't have to say, yeah, I'm eating oats again this morning. And they soak them in a liquid, usually skim milk to make them, make them barely chewable. And then most people add some berries or a few nuts. Uh, the nuts are okay, but muesli and berries breaks down 100% into glucose, fructose. There you go again, you know what those two things do. Number five, good breakfast food for diabetics is a full fat Greek yogurt with a good sprinkling of nuts. This is gonna give you all the amino acids you need, all the fatty acids you need, plus quite a few vi vitamins and minerals. Not perfect breakfast food, but pretty darn good if you need some variety as a diabetic. Number five, worst food for diabetics, and then I saved the worst for last, is cereal with skim milk. Any cereal that comes on in a box on this planet is a terrible food for diabetics. I don't care what it says on the label, how big the heart healthy 
label is on the box, it is crap. It is nothing but a grain that's been ultra processed and ground up. They've added a few fake vitamins and minerals back to it. And then when you pour skim milk on it, you're getting more sugar. And so the grains in the cereal and the lactose in the milk are gonna break down into glucose, fructose, and galactose. They are gonna all spike your blood sugar. The fructose and galactose are gonna help you store more fat in your liver another another bad thing so now then i'm going to leave you with this parting thought maybe you should just skip breakfast more and more diabetics are finding out that contrary to the popular opinion that breakfast is the most important meal of the day breakfast is optional you can sip on some black coffee or unsweetened tea or some sparkling water and you can do just fine. Anytime you put off eating, your blood sugar actually goes back towards low normal. And your insulin level that you make endogenously or the exogenous insulin you inject goes down because you just don't need as much insulin. That's a very good place for a diabetic to be with a low normal blood sugar and a low normal insulin level in their body. And of course you cannot come to my channel, which is a keto channel, and not hear Dr. Barry talk about how to start keto. I'll let him tell you all about it. Hello and welcome, this is Dr. Barry. In this video, I wanna to talk to you about ketogenic diet approved vegetables. So many people think that a ketogenic diet means that you live on bacon, butter, and ribeye steak, and that is not necessarily the case. I have some friends who do that and who seem to be thriving and doing very well, but you can eat vegetables on a ketogenic diet. Now let's talk about ketogenic vegetable. Number one is asparagus, one of my personal favorite ketogenic vegetables. It's very, very low carb. It has tons of vitamins and minerals in it. And it also has something called prebiotic fiber, which the bacteria in your gut, of which you have billions and billions, and you want them to be there, and you want them to be the right kind, and you want them to be very health healthy and happy. That helps you in hundreds of other ways. But asparagus has all that and more. All these vegetables have things in them called phytonutrients, which are microscopic little nutrients that aren't necessarily a vitamin or a mineral, but which are exceedingly good for your health. As I said in the other vi another video, shut up and eat your vegetables, okay? All right, number two is cabbage. Cabbage is, is a vegetable straight from the Lord. You cannot eat too much asparagus, you cannot eat too much cabbage. Uh, sometimes if I'm starving to death and I want to eat lunch, I'll go to a, a local buffet we have and I just eat so much cabbage and, and whatever meat happens to be on the buffet that the people think I'm going to turn into a cabbage. But you cannot beat cabbage. It's super low carb. It has a ton of good sulfur in it, which is something that you need. A lot of these vegetables have sulfur. It also has prebiotic fiber to feed your little bacteria in your gut and keep them very happy and healthy. The next is, of course, broccoli. You knew that was going to be on this list. And I tell people, dude, if you don't like veggies, you've got to learn to like veggies. Unless you want to be a carnivore, you have to eat vegetables because if you're eating the grains and the, and the starches and the sugars, your health will not improve. So broccoli has got omega-3. It's one of the few vegetables that actually is a good source of omega-3 fatty acids. It also has a ton of vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients. Next is kale. And just the word kale turns some people off, but I promise you any of these vegetables, if you hate them, let me tell you what to do. Chop them up, get some bacon grease, good and hot in the skillet, put some good sea salt in there, some good pepper, some good spices, because as you may or may not know, salt, pepper, and spices don't break your ketosis. They don't bother you in any way detrimentally as far as your health is concerned. You can use as much of them as you like. I personally love to heat up some bacon grease, put some salt in there, put a lot of curry powder and some pepper, and then throw my broccoli or throw my kale or my cabbage or my asparagus and stir fry that in there. Sometimes with uh, some good meat, sometimes without. But I promise you, when you get your spices and your salt pepper ratio correct, you'll eat kale and you'll love it. I promise you. Kale is very, very low carb. It has omega-3s, just like the broccoli. It has a ton of vitamins, minerals, and those yummy phytonutrients, some of which we may not even have discovered yet. 
The next vegetable on the list is celery. Celery is super low carb. I tell my patients, you could eat 20 pounds of celery a day. You won't gain an ounce. Okay. Celery. And people used to talk about negative calorie foods. That's not really a real thing. But effectively, it takes your body so much effort to break down the fiber and, and then in the celery. And then the celery is so full of the vitamins and minerals and other phytonutrients that it effectively becomes almost a negative calorie food, even though that's not a real thing, I'm quite aware. Next on the list is cucumbers, one of my personal favorites. I love to eat these raw. They're super easy to grow in your garden. Even if you live on the 87th floor of some high-rise apartment building, out on your balcony, if you face the south or the west or anywhere in between there, you can grow uh, cucumbers, they grow up on a vine. And so you can grow them right up the wall and enjoy these things right off the vine. I'll go out in the garden in the mornings barefoot and pick two or three cucumbers and just eat them right off the vine because I don't spray with anything. So they're organic. They might have a little bug poop on there, but I think that's good for me too. Next on the list is another, my second personal favorite, Brussels sprouts. And if you ever write the name of this vegetable down, make sure and you put the S at the end of Brussels. It's not Brussels sprouts. It's Brussels sprouts. I don't know why, but that's just how it is. And if you don't put that extra S on there, some uh, grammar Nazis will snub their nose at you. Brussels sprouts also are a great source of omega-3 as a veggie. They have tons of vitamins and minerals and they're very, very low carb. So eat your Brussels sprouts. Same way with those. I'll, I'll clean them. I'll cut them in half, get some bacon grease, really spiced up, good and hot in the skillet and lay them flat side down let them brown good and then and then flip them around and stir fry them a little bit. Nisha and I f- freaking love those things, man. They're so good when you do them that way, okay? Any of these vegetables, you can prepare them badly and they don't taste that great. But if you prepare them with the spices that you love and enough salt and pepper, I promise you, you can get them down until your palate learns to like them. I was just reading a study recently that the the adult human palate can be retrained. So if your husband or your wife lives on chicken strips and ketchup because they hate everything else in the world, that's not a permanent condition. You can retrain their palate slowly and lovingly. You can retrain their palate. Okay, that is a thing. The bonus vegetable is olives. Man, when I was a kid, I used to hate olives so much. And then one day I went to Whole Foods, and I'm sure other grocers are like this, but they had an olive bar. I just thought there was one kind of olive with the pimento in there and in the little jar, and you ate one a week or something like my grandfather did. But no, there are a ton of different varieties of all different shapes, sizes, and flavors of olives. And guess what they're all full of? Olive oil. Right. That's where olive oil comes from. Olives are so delicious, but they're so excellent for your health and for your nutrition. They're full of vitamins, they're full of minerals, and they're full of olive oil. Now, if you enjoyed this video, please, first of all, put some of what I said into practice because you need your veggies. The human body's made to eat vegetables. The vegans are right about that. We're supposed to eat a lot of vegetables, but I think we're also supposed to eat some other stuff too. If you want more information about keto, make sure you check out this video next. It goes into a lot of detail about keto. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you check out Dr. Barry, and I'll see you on the next video.